I know this morning that we have already have taken occasion to give the Lord thanks for a variety of different reasons and being able to reflect that as a community of believers is all that more important to build community and fellowship and, and admonition with one another in the Lord. I've often heard people say that, well, I praise God simply for who He is, for His holiness and His goodness, and I believe that is essential and important for our lives to praise God for simply who He is. And although that thought is true, He is worthy of worship simply based off His character alone, that He is holy, that He is good. And one might try to piously say, well, I worship the Lord simply because of who He is. And although that is true, I find that folks that really don't get out of the realm of praising the Lord for the measurable things really haven't gone through hardships and adversity. I worship the Lord simply off of who He is it should be paramount in our lives. But as we have demonstrated, there are some measurable things to which we must, as His children abiding in Christ, must give thanks for and recognize. And so we thank God for His blessings, His measurable, visible blessings. We thank, we thank Him for His holiness for his transcendent character and also his eminence. That he is otherworldly and beyond all this creation, above all and Lord of all, and yet still is eminent and close to you and I. And so we thank the Lord for measurable and visual blessings. I would like to take this moment just to thank the Lord for a few things in my life. See, as a pastor, I get a platform to do that. I get a platform to be able to thank the Lord for my, for my family and for the gift of, of life that is sometimes surprising and yet still a blessing at the same time. <laughs> so we thank the Lord for that. The miracle of life itself. And praise the Lord for health. Praise the Lord for a loving community of believers who... Sometimes we don't see eye to eye on everything, but we still love one another anyway, right? And my list can be extensive, as yours can as well. I thank the Lord for my salvation, as many in here would say, I thank the Lord for my salvation. I thank the Lord for reconciliation. I thank the Lord that He called me unto Himself. I was running as fast as I could away from Him. Many of us could say the same. In fact, you were. And the Lord, by His providence and His sovereignty, reached out and, and pulled me into Himself. A.W. Tozer wrote of Thanksgiving, he said, Gratitude is an offering precious in the sight of God. And it is one that the poorest of us can make and be not poor but richer for have, having made it. Giving up gratitude to the Lord. Gratitude for the blessings that He has given to us. So it is good to encourage one another and to edify them in their walk with, with Christ. You know, another element of thanksgiving can be found in generosity. Generosity. You know, I am thankful that we have a church that is generous. Not only in its giving, but also in admonishing one another and edifying one another in their walk. That at any moment, if I'm slipping, if I have somehow offended the living, uh, the living God, that my brothers and sisters in Christ can at, at any time give me a swift kick in the rear end and say, what are you doing? Yeah, I've got some men in my life that can do that. I've got some people, not physically, by the way, <laughs> who can hold me accountable through the Word. 
I pray that you have people in your life that you can as well. We can edify each other and show generosity both in our giving and generosity as we pour into the lives of others. Generosity is at the heart of true thanksgiving. So we can sit around the table and be thanking the Lord for things that he has blessed us with. But at the end of the day, generosity shows that it is at the heart of thanksgiving. For when we are truly thankful in what God has done, we find that we are truly giving as well. Alistair Begg said, I love Alistair Begg. I probably can't do it in that Scottish accent, so I'm not going to try to do it. But Alistair Begg said, hold material goods. You could probably hear it, can't you? Hold material goods and wealth on a flat palm and not in a clenched fist. And not in a clenched fist. So I'm thankful for a giving and generous church that is also missional minded. Who seeks to build the kingdom for the most part. Big K kingdom versus little K kingdom here. We want to be, build the big kingdom, right? The kingdom of Christ. That's what we want to help build. So I'm thankful for a generous church that is missional minded and that is evident in the many ministries that we're not trying to broadcast, we're not trying to boast in, but to give thanks that God, God puts us in those places and uses us. One more quote from theologian and preacher Harry Ironside said, we uh, would worry less if we praised more. You ever thought about that? We would pray, we would, we would worry less about the hardships in life if we would praise God more. Then he goes on to say, Thanksgiving is the enemy of discontent and dissatisfaction. And so in some way, praise to the Lord and thanking Him becomes in some regard a discipline in our lives. Now, I want to, I want to open our Bibles again to Philemon, if you have your page turned there. I want to, with our Bibles open to the book of Philemon, I want us to see what God's Word says of thanksgiving. And really, this is just, just one small snapshot in this greeting uh, that is used by the Apostle Paul. With the Lord's help, my plan is to work deductively through the book and then, and then point back to the main application found in verses 4 through 7. So we're going to work at, at, through the book as a, as a total and then we're going to work down uh, to those elemental points uh, between verses 4 and 7 and looking, toward the app, uh, looking towards the application. Simply put, we're going, to go, we're going to look at the book as a whole and then come down to those four verses. Okay, so let's, uh, with our Bibles open before us, let's uh, seek the Lord uh, that, he would, uh, that he would speak to us through his word. And we know that we, he will, but help us to have ears to hear and help us to be obedient. And let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this moment in your word. And uh, already our minds have probably already been circulating and going through things systematically of which things that we can be thankful for and, and to give you praise. And, and I hope and pray that as a Christ follower, that has been uh, kind of our, our, uh, our trademark through our lives. Uh, that uh, our lifestyle has been one that we have given thanks to the Lord for the things that he has done. Uh, not just to be etched onto a, cal a calendar uh, in, in November. That's marked Thanksgiving. But that would be kind of our trademark, uh, our fingerprint as, as children of God is that we are forever thankful. So today, Lord, even though we are coming upon a season of Thanksgiving, may our lives be one of Thanksgiving. Lord, we love you and we thank you. If there's one here today, uh, Lord, who needs, who needs you as Savior, Lord, you, you know them. Uh, all we can do, uh, Lord, is all we can do is share the good news and you do the work. And we're thankful for that. Uh, Lord, we, uh, we want to give this time to you as we read through your word and, and look at some scripture of thanksgiving. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. So the book of Philemon, written, of course, by the hand of the Apostle Paul, there is hardly any uh, dispute of that authorship written by the hand of the Apostle Paul while he was in prison in Rome. And he had a friend by the name of Philemon, which bears, uh, which bears his name in the, in the letter. And so uh, a, a person that may not be a student of the Bible, I can say, you know, uh, I can say, well, I'm going to preach through a whole book of the Bible on Sunday morning. And they probably sweat a little bit, you know, whoa. Find out it's the book of Philemon, one chapter, just a few short verses, but it's very powerful in its in the message that is contained. Again, Philemon is a book, and one of the themes, a premier theme, is one of reconciliation. And so here we got we have uh, we have Philemon, who Paul had won to the Lord while he was at Colossae. He had grown close to 
um, he had grown close to Philemon as a friend and as a brother in Christ. You know people like that in your lives, don't you? That you can confide in, that you have grown close to in your walk. The common denominator, other than the Lord Jesus Christ and his salvation, was a runaway servant by the name of Onesimus. Now here is Onesimus. His offense, in a nutshell, was that he stole from his master and had made his way to Rome in a way of fleeing, but he come and ended up face to face with the Apostle Paul. Now you know any time that you read in the same sentence or the thought that this person come into contact with the Apostle Paul that he was going to hear about Jesus. And that is exactly what happened to Onesimus. Uh, the evidence might show us in verse 10 that he may have come into contact with the Apostle Paul while he was in prison, preached the gospel. He came face to face with Paul, but better yet, came face to face, if you will, with the Lord and Savior and was forever changed. Now, not only did Paul uh, meet Onesimus, but Onesimus in return met the Lord Jesus as Savior and then was forever changed. But now, as Onesimus is a new uh, convert, a new uh, creature in Christ, as Onesimus is, um, has a different, supposed to have a different worldview, a different way of thinking, here comes the hard part in Onesimus' life. Here, becomes, here, here comes the test factor in his life. Now, what does he do as a Christ follower and as a person that has sinned first against God and then has sinned against another person? Well, the sin against God is, is taken care of on the cross. His sin against God has been taken care of through the work of Jesus. So now Onesimus is left with the consequence of his sin that he had that he had performed against his master Philemon. And this becomes difficult for Onesimus. If he were any, any person, it would become difficult. Now I've become saved. I'm a new creature in Christ. There are some things that, that, I, that I'm going to reap the consequence of my past sin, things that I might need to make right with my brothers and, and sisters, or I might just need, need, need to make right altogether. So here becomes the difficult part on Onesimus. He needs to make it right. And the Apostle Paul will help discipline him along the way. Will help disciple him along the way. And now I, I know that church discipline is a very, very important factor of any healthy body. Some see church discipline as you have a problem with your brother, you go to that person, and the end result should always be that you come before the church and then that person will either be repented or you kick him out of the church. When all in all, what we find is that church discipline is to restore those to a rightful and healthy relationship with Christ and then with the body. On every occasion of church discipline, we, always, we do not always look for that person to stand before the church and to have them, uh, if you will, uh, to be excommunicated, quote unquote, from, uh, from the church. The result is that we restore that person in their walk with the Lord uh, because we know uh, we should know better than anyone, as sin festers in the body, sin affects the whole body. And so it must be addressed. But I want you to know this. Many people say, unless we see someone stand in front of the church, we haven't executed church discipline. But from a pastoral, from a pastoral standpoint, can I assure you that we are always engaged in church discipline? Always. You might not see it, and the reality is you don't need to see it. Not everybody needs to see what everybody is going through all at once. We don't need to have church discipline on display for everyone to see unless there is an issue that is not taken care of in the initial steps of church discipline. But I can assure you from a pastoral sense of, uh, of looking out, church discipline is happening in this body. And you ought to be rejoicing for that. You ought to be happy for that. People are hearing the word. Let me assure you this. I'm thankful, by the way, for this. People are hearing the word. People are being changed by the word. They're being transformed by the word. And then they're learning to live out their faith in a strong and, and vibrant way. Church discipline always doesn't, doesn't always have to show up with people coming before the church. So for that, we're thankful that the Lord is moving 
and he is and he is working. So let's get back to let's get back to Onesimus. Okay, so Onesimus under the under the leadership of the Apostle Paul, as he's going to dis- discipline him along the way, and by the law, the master could have easily uh, Philemon had. Uh, had every right, if you will, to execute judgment upon Onesimus. But we find the model and the example of this particular epistle is this. It is of reconciliation. It it is a reconciliation from Philemon to his servant and then on behalf of the Apostle Paul to, to plead for Philemon to show grace to Onesimus, not only as a servant, but also now as a brother or sister, uh, well, brother in Christ. But Paul is the master of the persuasive language. Next to the Lord Jesus, we find no greater teacher or preacher than the Apostle Paul in persuasive language. And he utilizes the most appropriate, the most sensible approach, the best arguments, if you will, to compel Philemon towards reconciliation with Onesimus. And the very last in the very last portion of the verse, he says in verse 21, in fact, he says, he's, I'm confident of your obedience. He knows Philemon. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. So he knows. He knows Philemon. He's going to do, do the right thing. But he compels him to show grace. It teaches, it teaches us that just because a person becomes a Christ follower, it doesn't mean that their crimes will be a sponge. Their sins, yes. And many times there are consequences from our past crimes. And Paul is not saying, listen, you have every right, but show grace and show mercy. We have every right as sinners. We have every right as people who were born as children of disobedience. We have, God has every right to cast us away from him. He had every right to not show any grace at all. If God was to save one person from hell, he would still be merciful and gracious. But we know God's character is long-suffering and merciful and loving. Now Paul doesn't steer Onesimus steer away from Onesimus facing his crimes. Paul is simply asking for grace and a way to reconcile. And even ministers of the gospel, uh, you know, one find that there might be uh, a wrong that need to be righted, a payment that need to be made. And so that's what Paul is asking for on behalf of, of Onesimus, the servant who had stolen from his master. Over and over again, through the book, reconciliation shows up. Over and over again, we find this, uh, that, it, it, that it permeates with the richness of God's grace. And, and how this grace can be extended to people like, like you and like me who are sinners. And that is, a, that is a great mystery. Remember how Paul writes about this mystery, this great mystery? That is a great mystery. How God's grace and mercy can be extended to people who are sinners like you and me? This, this letter also teaches, just in a small portion, the beauty and the reality of the transformative work of the Holy Spirit. How God, for lack of better words, cleans us up, sanctifies us. We're in this process of sanctification, looking more like Jesus daily, hopefully. And then we identify with Onesimus, and that he might be the chiefest of criminals. We were the chiefest of sinners. Now let's look at the book uh, and we'll look through a few verses together. And remember verses 4 through 7, we're going to zero in just a little bit closer in. I want, you, I want us to look at this, Paul, as a prayer of thanksgiving and look through it through the lens of things to be thankful for. And I've got a few things marked out. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to shift through the ESV, the English Standard Version you find on the, on the screen, and then I'm going to shift from time to time to the International Standard Version. And so if it looks a little different, that's fine. It carries the same carries the same message. Okay, so let's look together. Paul says, he is a prisoner for Christ uh, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved and fellow worker. A prisoner for Christ tells us he's in prison and he is is a servant. It's it's funny how Paul would use this, uh, uh, not necessarily play on words, but a prisoner or to be a servant for Christ. And then he says, and Aphia and our sister uh, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house, grace to you and peace 
from God our Father, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. A standard greeting, we find this over and over again, just giving thanks, uh, just giving uh, a bit of, you know, I'm a servant to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a slave in the good sense of the way that the Lord has me in his care. And then we find in verse 4 some things to be thankful for. He says in verse 4, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. So something to be thankful for that we might find through this verse. He says he always, he thanks God that he can remember them, uh, remember him in his prayers because he is now a brother in Christ. It is wonderful to know that we can pray for one another. And at the end of the day, I don't know if you pray for me. I pray and I hope that you do, that you pray for me. And I know that there's some that, that do. And you can say the same for others in the body. That you have some faithful, faithful saint of the Lord that is praying for you today. I hope that you know that you are being prayed for. And then we find in verse 5. Because I hear of your love. So some things that would mark is I hear of your love and your faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus for all the saints. In verse 5 is very interesting that we find what is the premise of human flourishing in a Christian community. I hear the love that you have for the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus said. You will find the summation of the law is that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, body, everything, everything within you. You love and worship the Lord that way. And then he says, you will love your neighbor as yourself. What we find in verse 5 is a tip of the hat, if you will, to the premise of human flourishing in Christian community, loving Jesus with all you have and then loving one another in that same veracity, loving one another as we are in Christian community. And in verse 6, I pray that sharing your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing. And that is in us for the sake of Christ. For the sake of Christ, he says. For I have derived much joy and comfort uh, from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through, through you. So, so those are the very core verses that we focused in on if we want to mark some things for thanks to be thankful for uh, love we, we mark sharing your faith being able to share your faith and, and, and to encourage one another in their faith for the sake of Christ and then to send out folks to, to do that very same thing and then and to be able to thank the Lord for joy and the comfort that we have in one another and then to be refreshed by that there's nothing more precious to me than the time that we share in revival come October uh, that is one of the most refreshing times for me to be able to to be revived and refreshed through the edification of one another. So let's look at the rest of these verses in closing. For this reason, although in the Messiah, I have complete freedom to order you as an apostle, exercising his apostleship, to do what is proper. I prefer to make an appeal. I, per, I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. Remember, he just thanked him for his love. Paul, as an old man, and now a prisoner in Rome for Jesus the Messiah. I appeal to you on behalf of my child Onesimus. Imagine Philemon reading this, uh, reading this letter. I know that we would not translate based on someone, what someone might be thinking other than what the scripture will dictate to us. But one can imagine if, you are read, if he's reading this and he sees this word Onesimus come across in the letter his thoughts are probably all over the place. Yeah, that's the slave that stole from me. He says, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. What is this? He has become, I have become like a father to him. In essence, he is saying he has led him to the Lord Jesus. Once he was useless to you, he ran off with your money. He's no good to you now. But now he is both very useful to you and me as a child of God. He is useful to you. Number one, he will serve in the propagation of the good news. And he will also serve as an object and a teaching lesson for that of reconciliation. I send him back to you. It's like I'm coming along with him. So if you see Anesimus coming up the path, you can say that it is like me coming with him. That's how much I have supported uh, Onesimus in his changed life. I wanted to keep him, uh, keep him with me so that he could serve me in your place during my imprisonment. And here it is for the gospel. You have to understand the gospel letter, especially this one for Philemon, was always for the gospel, for the cause of the gospel, and for the good news. And verse 14, yet I do not want to do anything without your consent, so that, you, so that your good deed might not be something forced but voluntary. You have every right, you have every right, Philemon, 
to execute judgment, if you will, on your servant Onesimus, but I am pleading for grace. Perhaps this is why he was separated from you a while back, so that you could have him back forever. What is interesting about this, you think that the Apostle Paul is speaking something about the sovereignty and the providence of our Lord? That's yes. He is speaking something about the sovereignty of God. This has happened to you so that Onesimus would come into my path, the Apostle Paul, so that he would hear the good news, be forever changed and transformed, and that you could have him back forever as a Christ-following servant, a worker that should work for the glory of Christ through all that he, for all that he does. And so we would say, well, you know, we look for Christian bakers, no. We look for Christian plumbers, no. We look for Christian organizations, not necessarily. We look for people who are good in their trade. They might have a Christ follower here or there. People who are in their trade who are good. We want to live out our faith in all that we do and exhibit Christ in all that we do. So he says, so that you can have him back forever to work for you, to, to work for Christ, to be an example of reconciliation before you. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave. Now as a dear brother, especially to me. And we could even look at the spiritual sense that underlines this. He's not no longer a slave to sin, but now a child of God abiding in Christ. And evermore he says, both as a person and as a believer. So he says, here's this persuasive language. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. Paul standing in the place of Onesimus, kind of being an advocate of sorts. If he had wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to my account. And so, the gospel message should be ringing true in this verse. But the scripture speaks of Christ that he who knew no sin became sin so that we would be the righteousness of God. So that we would be righteous in the eyes of God of God. Charge it to my account. He says, I, Paul, I'm writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I will not mention to you that you owe me your very life, by the way. Yes, brother, I desire that favor from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Messiah. Bring me rejoicing. Let me see. Let me see this come into place. Let me see this reconciliation. Let us see, brothers and sisters, in the body of Christ, reconcile one to another. Where there might be hard feelings, where there might be some issue through a brother and sister in the church, in the local body, that we would see reconciliation and then the church itself would be refreshed. Refresh my heart, he says in Messiah. Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you because I know that you will do even more than I ask. I know you. And then in closing, he says, Meanwhile, prepare a great a guest room for you, uh, for me too. For I am hoping through your prayers to be returned to you. I do hope and pray that you can sense the theme of reconciliation through that. But God had every right to cast us away from him because of our sin and sinfulness. Yet he has elected to call us into himself. I hope and pray that you can see that reconciliation where Onesimus would have been guilty of his crime and Philemon could have cast him away, cast him in prison, even have stoned him to death. And yet Paul said, we aren't given a conclusion other than we know that you're going to do the right thing. So what I want us to do in this moment before we sing, before Jason comes to sing, what I want us to do right now in just a few seconds, I'll ask you if you will, just in this moment, Let's everyone bow their heads. I'm not, I'm not going to do the bow your head and close your eyes and raise your hand. I'm not going to do that. I ask you if you will, just right now, let's just take a few seconds. I'm going to be quiet. I know you're saying amen. Let's take a few moments, a few seconds if you will. Silent before the Lord. And let's just thank Him for His goodness and the measurable blessings that you can see. Thank Him for... Thank him for reconciliation. Let's just do that in just a few moments.
Lord, we, we do thank you for calling us to yourself. Lord, we were running as fast as we could for, for hell. Lord, we were running as fast as we could away from you. By your grace, you've called us to yourself. I pray if there's one here who, who doesn't know that, that salvation that you offer, Lord, and I pray that today, through your grace and your mercy, you would call them to yourself. Uh, Lord, I pray for us as your body, as we're giving thanks in this moment, that we thank you for our salvation. Thank you, Lord, that you have indeed, you've reconciled us to the Father, and now that we are righteous in his sight through Christ. We can sing of your grace. We can sing of your blessings. And our list can be extensive. In fact, we could be here, we could be here to eternity, giving you thanks for the many things giving you praise for it. And one day we'll be able to do that forever and ever as we'll be able to sing uh, to, holy, holy, holy to the Lord God Almighty as a multitude around the throne. But let us enjoy a bit of that right here, right now as we sing worship unto you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll ask you if you will, let's stand. For those who might just want to come to the altar to pray and give thanks to the Lord, please do that.